Welcome back to the Auto Blog Podcast. I'm Greg Migliori. We've got an awesome show for you this week. The Toyota Land Cruiser is coming back. Surprised? Maybe not. I don't know. But hey, let's bring in senior editor for all things electric, John Snyder. We've got a great show for you. What's going on? Ah, man. Just uh, happy to be here. Yeah. It's a beautiful weather. Um, got to roll those. Last time, you know, it was roll the windows all the way down weather. And now it's roll the windows part way up it's like yeah in the 50s but sunny i like it it's 53 degrees right now yeah. i um literally some sort of ventilation came on last night and i turned to my wife and i go is that the heat like what <laughs> what, what is this here so we're getting kind of a wild june i like it the grass is flipped sort of to green kind of yeah. overnight so that's good but yeah, so we're doing kind of an early podcast today, 9.30 Eastern time. We don't always do it this early. We're just talking about how hard it is for us to eat breakfast at our busy schedules, uh, like inhaling a bagel. So anyway, so the Land Cruiser's coming back. That'll lead our news seg- segment. We've got uh, news out of the supercharging network with Tesla, uh, some c- cyber truck issues as well. We'll talk about the Bolt coming back and a few other things. We have been driving. Uh, John's in our long term. Toyota Sienna minivan, he played some PlayStation, or someone did. He also drove uh, an electric school bus, and we've got the Chrysler 300C, the final edition, and the Ford Escape. So, we'll get to that, as many of those as we can. Let's just jump right in. Um, I don't know if surprise was the right word that the Land Cruiser is coming back, because we kind of thought it might, but there was also like that sort of note of finality that it probably wasn't going to come back for a while. And when it did, it wouldn't be sort of what it was. It might be different in many ways. But mm-hmm. this sounds like they're going to bring the Land Cruiser Prado over here or tweak the GX or some you know combination of that recipe and bring it here pretty quick. So, um, I mean, I like it, you know. Yeah, the, the, the fact that they announced that they were bringing it back like right after they launched the, the GX, um, the new GX. Uh, seems a little too convenient to be a coincidence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but, I mean, uh, it, it makes a lot of sense too. I mean, the oh, luxury yeah. SUV market for big SUVs, like why wouldn't you want to build a $90,000 SUV that's pure profit, right? Right. Exactly. But yeah, I I think, uh, yeah, the Land Cruiser has, you know, mega fans behind it. Uh, yeah. I'm, it, <laughs> I'm not really a big f- fan of of huge cars like that but um but i grew up in a land cruiser my dad drove land cruisers so i i you know that's what i was driving when i had my driving permit um and man it was fun (laughs) but yeah Yeah. something a little smaller like the prado um it's a little interesting because it's gonna be bumping up pretty close to the 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 forerunner if if that's Mm -hmm. the case um but I mean, the, and you know, the Forerunners feel so, you know, kind of dated now. Um, but I imagine they'll update that at some point soon. So it'll be interesting to see how they position this, uh, you know, within the within the Toyota lineup. I could see them using some of the basic, you know, elements like of their, you know, newer upcoming vehicles, and then like stretching the platform a little bit mm-hmm. to make it a little more Land Cruiser like. Um, you know, but I mean, I guess we'll see. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's one of their strongest nameplates. You know, yeah. it makes sense to make just makes too much sense to do it. And, you know, I think I think we'll see this with the Forerunner. They'll maintain like the essence of what it is. But you're going to see like, you know, way more modern, like infotainment, drivetrain, things like that. Like the last generation Land Cruiser was like driving an SUV from 2000 and eight yeah. which it is <laughs> you know and that's kind of how the forerunner is now mm-hmm. so i mean i think there could be some good things for people who want to buy a new vehicle not buy a new vehicle that's actually like almost 20 years old um you know frankly a, a compelling reason to buy the outgoing land cruiser was a little bit of nostalgia you know yeah for sure um you know maybe you liked how cars were 15 years ago so yeah well yeah um <laughs> yeah, the 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 way it drove definitely felt sort of old and you know, really sort of squishy suspension. 
but yeah, the, the tech inside definitely needed some updating. Um, yeah. So we'll see that for sure. Yeah. And I hope they keep somewhat of the Land Cruiser vibe that they've had, you know, as far as the design element. And I'm sure they will. I don't yeah. think this is a vehicle you go too far afield on, but I always like that. I think it was... It was solid. It's Bluey's car, you know, the yeah. <laughs> car two dogs. They drive a much older version down in uh, Australia. But yeah. um, all right. So that's a Lad Cruiser. Um, I'm pretty excited to drive it. So um, all right. Shifting gears, Elon Musk opened up the Tesla supercharger network to GM customers. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an interesting move. It's like the second time in like two or three weeks, you know, a Detroit automaker has signed on. Uh, Mary Barra did a Twitter Spaces interview with Elon Musk. Um, it, it's kind of surreal. You know, we get like no notice these things are happening. Yeah. And then boom, he's on there and um, it's pretty wild. I mean, I think the broader implications, and we were kind of talking about this offline, is like, yeah, we're moving toward a national charging standard. standard it's Tesla's, you know? Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I mean, it's it's already pretty well named that standard, the North American charging yeah. standard. It's like a uh, self fulfilling prof prophecy. Um, but no, I, I think that's uh, that's a good thing um, for everyone. That I, I personally like Tesla's charging standard. Um, their plugs are nice and small and, and mm -hmm. light, and um, you know, it's one for AC and DC. You know, have you know this chunky little extra blob on there to to uh plug in for dc um and yeah the, the sooner we get to just one standard across the mm -hmm. industry um the better the charging experience will be for everyone it, there's going to be some growing pains in there with you know uh you know, compatibility and things like that because tesla's um you know, if if you're a Tesla charging a supercharger, it's really seamless. You know, you 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 plug in, and, and that's pretty much it. Yeah. Um, and that's the case with some other vehicles have have plug and charge on, you know, CCS. But, um, yeah, how I don't know how well that's going to work with you know GM or Fords if you plug into a te Tesla supercharger, you know, they're, or if a Tesla plugs into you know, a non Tesla charger, it's not going to be quite as seamless as that, at least at first until they, you know, get it all organized under one roof, um, work out those kinks. And then, and then yes, then there will be a, a better experience for everyone in, in my opinion. No, I think charging has to be a thing where like, you just, you don't think about it, you know, it just works. Yeah, uh, I've had some issues with charge point stations recently, and it's been a little frustrating. Um, you know, and it's everything from the app to, you know, the way you have to position the car sometimes mm -hmm. to just randomly it they don't work. You know, yeah. and that that's frustrating. So I I actually enjoy charging the electric vehicles that come through our test fleet. I just yeah. think it's an interesting kind of fun thing to do. That you know, I, I don't have that same vibe about going to fill up like whatever car I've got to gas up at the end of the week. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of neat to do it. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you know, Ford and GM have talked about adapters, which will make it um, easier, if you will. Uh, there's a lot of fine print here, a lot of sort of devil in the details that yeah. needs to be worked out. Um, but I think another, another thing to consider is that Tesla uh, is rumored to be coming out with a, a version four of its uh, superchargers. Mm -hmm. um in the near future maybe next year um and those will be you know capable of 350 kilowatt charging and um will have longer cords so you know the the, yeah. the problems right now of you know the, the way that the charger are positioned and which side the the cord is on and all that um and people having to park in the in the spot next to it to charge that yeah. sort of thing um, that will hopefully be addressed with this new um, new supercharger version that's that's going to be coming out, um, and yeah, that then you know three hundred fifty kilowatts it will be you know right up there with Electrify America in terms of charging speed, and and I think uh, you know if 
Tesla, any Tesla owners are out there, I think they, they'll probably say that, yeah, they, they probably have a better charging experience anyway. Yeah. They, they tend to charge closer to their peak rate um, than, you know, other EVs do when you, when you plug them in. A lot of times you plug in at a 350 kilowatt charger in, in our EV6 and it just doesn't get anywhere. It, you know, it maxes out like what, 235 or something, but it doesn't even get anywhere close to that. Um, especially if it's cold <laughs> yeah. and, you know, it, and if the batteries, you know, it t- takes a long time for it to, to actually get anywhere near that, that peak charging point. Whereas Tesla, I think they have a little bit better, um, you know, more, the uh, standard charging rate throughout the, throughout the charge experience. It's interesting too. It seemed to almost catch the like the government a little flat footed because a couple of days later they announced you know a big plan for the CCS connectors. Uh, it was kind of like hmm, I don't know. Did you guys know that like Ford and GM were going to do this? Maybe not. Because <laughs> I mean, when you look at Ford, GM, and Tesla, the number I'm seeing is sixty percent of the EV market. So yeah, you know it, that's a lot of. You know, that's like, I mean, when you think of American consumers, you've got Tesla for electrics and Ford General Motors for everything else and electrics, you know, as far as just pure household domestic names. So, um, you know, we'll see. And maybe, you know, you might get to a point where like, and I think during the transition period, there'll be like, like a menu of chargers. You pull up, there'll be CCS, there'll be NACs, um, that type of thing. People will be having adapters. Long term, like like you just said, though, I don't think that's the way to go. You just want to pull up, not worry about the adapter, pull in just like the gas station, you know? Yeah, yeah it'll just be so. people with older older EVs that will have to worry about the adapter. And everyone else, you know, all the new ones that you buy will be, it'll just be easy. All right. So this is just pure eye candy. We kind of got to talk about it, though. The Porsche yeah. Mission X, it's a hypercar. It's a concept. It's sort of like a signpost for like the next Porsche hypercar, sort of following the footsteps of like, you know, remember the 918 and things yeah. like that. Uh, yeah, Porsches do. I think this this works. Uh, for what it's worth, I've been looking at a lot of different like hyper and supercars from a variety of different places. This one's tasteful. You know what I mean? Like it looks pretty good. Whereas like if you look at like Rimac and some of the other ones that go way out there, like... This looks, I think, pretty good. It does look good. It it is a little bit out there for for Porsche, but they yeah they they do have you know I mean it's an electric vehicle. They have the mm-hmm. opportunity to make it a little different to you know position the batteries where you want it and yeah, basically it, it looks like yeah uh, you know sort of mid engine format even even though it's you know no engine yeah but, uh, but yeah it looks that that has that sort of format and um yeah it's it's beautiful very race race e you know mm-hmm. race ish um with the uh all the uh the chronograph inside and the lap timers and the that wild steering wheel very much um looks like it's borrowed from one of the open wheel uh racing series um but yeah this thing is really cool and uh joel's piece on it some of the details about it um i like that it has an animal mascot there's a little cheetah badge hidden very very uh cleverly um you know sort of on the rear fender sort of under some of the arrow it looks really cool and the way the doors open up man this thing is it's beautiful the seats the seats are something else yeah, the headlights look pretty good too. That's like they're like, you know, they go right across the fenders to like inches off the ground. It's yeah. it's really cool. It kind of brings back some of like uh Porsche's like Lamar heritage yes. you know, thrown in here a little bit, which I think is good. Um, yes, very much. <laughs> all right. So check that story out. And Joel has a nice follow-up piece where he breaks down some of the key elements of the mission X. Uh check that out. Um, yeah, we don't really it's have really good we don't really have specs on it because yeah. it's, it's a concept, but, uh, but gosh, it's a, it's a beautiful design study. Indeed. Indeed. All right. So maybe this is still a design study. It's apparently on the way to production, but we had a piece come uh, last week 
about how leaked documents show significant early issues with Tesla Cybertruck. Our breathless headline reads. Um, so I, I'm just curious, you know, the Cybertruck, I feel like, is at a point where it kind of needs to get here. That's my <laughs> takeaway. And this story just kind of reiterates that, you know. I mean, what do you think is up with the Cybertruck? I don't know. I think it's it might just be Elon Musk's uh, sort of clean sheet uh, look at the process, um, the way mm -hmm. he goes about uh, developing cars, um, combined with this being such a different vehicle. Um, you know, it's very much not like your typical, you know, cabin bed truck, um, you know, total clean sheet design. It's, it's, um, yeah, of course you're going to run into problems, but the, the, this report makes it sound like the problems are pretty fundamental. They're, they're, they're bad. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, not sealed. Um, yeah problems with the the braking suspension and, and and leaks and noise and uh, it sounds like a lot of stuff that at this point those should be uh you know pretty well figured out <laughs> yeah the the report comes from a german newspaper and then it was picked up again by wired and that's when you know american outlets like us kind of realized what was going on it is like rudimentary stuff like blocking and tackling like bodywork yeah. seals Stuff like that, um, you know, noise handling, braking suspension to read more from our story. That's a little, that's odd. And honestly, I think it's, it's a missed opportunity if that stuff is what's holding them up because mm -hmm. that's not really something that has to be unique to the Cybertruck. Like that's just a thing that you should have figured out for any new vehicle. Now, can stuff go wrong? With any new vehicle, of course it can. Look at some of the launch issues Ford has had in the last couple of years, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's it's one of those things where I think context and perspective is fair. But it's also like, you know, the revolutionary part of this is the design, some of the different like G-Wiz features, the fact that it's an all-electric pickup truck. Like, that, those are the selling points. Like, you know, the other stuff, it seems like you just need to like, you know, kind of figure out. It's like if... You know, you have some like, I don't know, use a football analogy, like every now and then you'll like, maybe the team you like is really good, but like they don't have a kicker. And you're like, <laughs> how do we keep losing games? Because the guy misses wide right, you know? Yeah. And it's like, it can be frustrating. So that, that to me is what this feels like. I went to one of those Monroe, uh, they're like a local like um, industry uh, sort of analysis firms, such as it is. And they did a breakdown of uh, a Tesla model mm -hmm. and they were talking about just how sophisticated everything was except the build quality. Mm -hmm. And, you know, take it for what it's worth. It was a walk around. They, you know, they had their own, you know, reasons for doing it, but they invited the press to come look at it. And, you know, I, I don't think it's like dunking on Tesla to say like it's it's odd that they have quality issues with like like build quality. So to me, that's where you just get into this missed opportunity and, you know, like, come on, I think this could be a real home run. Um, I don't know. It's I don't know the, the reasons for them though. Yeah. It's one of those reasons why I wish, you know, I would, we would see Tesla. I mean, we're seeing them collaborate with, you know, Ford and GM on charging and stuff. I would like to see them collaborate with someone on manufacturing, <laughs> you know, um, they could, give their technology to to somebody and, and and then in turn maybe get some uh materials from another supplier and uh maybe avoid some of these problems i'd hate to see the cybertruck released as sort of a half-baked product and then tesla sort of fixing it on the fly as the first owners are basically their guinea pigs for, mm -hmm. you know, what's going to go wrong in the real world. Um, as you know, Tesla seems to do with, yeah, I mean, that they, that was sort of the case with the model three, um, you know, sort of the case with, uh, full self driving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just, you know, it's, they need to get that part. They need to get the part where they 
build something and it's complete before they put it out. And I think they yeah. might need help with that. But yeah. I mean, I certain someone like you wrote a column saying, hey, it's good when <laughs> Tesla works with other automakers because in some ways everybody wins. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. They sort of have the secret sauce in many fronts, but then there's just these other like, you know, almost very unthinkable mistakes they make, you know? Yeah. Um, and maybe that's what makes them Tesla is they can move fast yeah. and reach, reach these like hills that other companies don't even go for. But then you kind of maybe miss sight of what's in front of you. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we'll see. It's, um, I mean, I have, I think we, well, I don't know if we will, but people will be driving the Cybertruck, I think, somewhat in the near future, you know, uh, but we'll see how it goes. And I, and, you know, we could be wrong. Every, everything could be hunky dory when it comes out. I, mm -hmm. I know for sure that, that people are going to love it <laughs> when it comes yeah. out. I mean, I think I'm going to like it. This yeah. is, I like that era of wedge shaped design that the Cybertruck harks back to. Like, you know, you want to, you know, show me like, like mid seventies to kind of mid eighties wedge shaped cars. Sign me up for that all day, whether it's yeah. a Lancia or a, like an Escort or something. So, you know, I, I'm on board with that. Yeah. But, all right. So let's transition to the Chevy Bolt is coming back. And yeah, I think it's interesting probably coming back. Mary Barra strongly hinted to NPR that the Bolt would be coming back, probably with Altium Power. That's their new battery pack, um, their new sort of, you know, setup. You've had an up close look at it. Um, the, the, the Bolt sort of went away for a few reasons. One, they needed a place to build some other higher value vehicles. Like I believe it's the uh, a factory in Michigan is going to build the Lake Orion is going to build the Silverado EV. And it's like, hmm, where are we going to make more money here? The Chevy truck EV or the Bolt compact car? Mm -hmm. So somebody gets kicked off the island. It also wasn't quite selling as well. It had an older battery setup. That didn't charge as quickly, although the range was still very respectable. It was, yeah. And of course, <laughs> and they it's, had. It's great go to ahead. drive too. <laughs> it was great to drive too. And then, just real quick, they had some big issues with that big recall, potential fires. Yes. So, like, I mean, just goes to show you, like, any car company could really screw up. So it's like, yeah, you know, anybody who's listening to this thinking, oh, "Are they dunking on Tesla?" Well, no, we we dunk on everybody when they screw up. And the Bolt had some pretty unthinkable problems. Yeah, so um, that, that battery thing was a, a nightmare. That was bad, <laughs> really bad. Um, but it sounds like it's coming back. And I don't think the image of the Bolt was damaged so much that it's a problem. I think, you know, I still see a lot of them on the road. I've seen them in other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. I think it did find an audience because people like the idea of a $30,000-ish compact crossover or car. It drove great. Yeah. And, and yeah, when, when they came out with the Equinox pricing, um, mm -hmm. you know, saying, you know, it's going to start around 30,000, it's like, you know, with the Bolt as it is, why would you buy the Bolt over that unless you're confined to a, a small parking spot? <laughs> yeah. The <laughs> new know? Equinox looks really good, I think. Yeah. And it offers you a lot of, you know, functionality for what it was for the price and for the size. Um, I actually took it to a Bronco uh, drive. This is a couple years ago, local drive. And I drove the Bolt up to Holly Oaks, just north of the city. Uh -huh. And I remember thinking, this thing's great. I am not as excited to drive the Bronco off-road because, you know, come on, right? Yeah. But it was still a very memorable part of that day. So, you know, the Bolt had its supporters. I'll be curious to see, like, if they could carve out that almost like commodity EV. And I think for GM, that would be a great move. There's not that many, there really aren't that many options for people who, you know, are less affluent and don't want to spend a ton of money on, you know, a larger electric crossover or car. For sure. Yeah. Especially if it's something that you don't drive very much. Like I, I considered mm -hmm. getting a, a Bolt um, mm -hmm. just because I, I, I wouldn't drive it very much, but I, you know, I don't have a daily personal daily driver myself right now. Um, and that would be, that would be the perfect second car for our household, something mm -hmm. to run the kids around town. Um, that sort of thing. We've got the Palisade for the, the bigger trips. 
Um, but yeah, if they bring the bolt back mm. with Ultium technology, um, slot it under the Equinox and give it a, a, a nice low price, um, yeah, it'll be great. <laughs> cool. So speaking of things coming back from the dead, we'll run through a couple items here real quick. That Those barn find Ferraris that went up for auction, I mean, holy cow, <laughs> man. Like the one that was like, designed by Pin and Farina and was just like a wreck. They like it wrecked in a race like 60 years ago and then they left it. It's sort of our lead image. So you should check the story out. It's, <laughs> it's pretty wild. And then you can click through to some of the links in the RM, uh, the RM uh, auctions catalog and see some of the, like the different more details, some cool stuff in there that you could definitely concourse ready. But that was the one that stood out to me. I was like, holy cow, this is just, um, this is just wild. But yeah, there's I, there's some really neat uh cards in that collection for sure. Um the the yeah, 20 lost Ferraris mm -hmm. <laughs> and some nearly destroyed. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, there's a there's a wide variety of of conditions there and it's neat it's neat to see that. Um it's just a uh, I love barn finds. They're just Yeah, such, me too. <laughs> such a cool such an exciting thing. Yeah. So check those out, click through the pictures and, um, you know, it's, it's definitely worth your time. That that's the kind of thing I like to read when I, when I had more time on like Saturday and Sunday mornings is, you know, going the like retro kind of old Ferraris and, you know, different, different sites like the New York times wheels blog, when it was a thing was good at that. We like to think we're pretty good at that. Um, so check it out. It's a pretty cool story. Uh, did you catch any of Le Mans last weekend? Speaking of old racers and Ferraris. Uh, I, I did not. Yeah, I did a little bit. And I just, I don't know. I think it's, I, I, I used to go to like some ALMS races back when I worked for Auto Week. And, um, you know, I saw some of the IMSA stuff, um, you know, more recent. Yeah, I've seen that more recently. Um, it's just, it's kind of a cool watch. You know, it's on it's on for 24 hours. Yeah. You can come and go as you want. And I thought it was cool to see Ferrari come back and win. Um, it was unfortunate that the Toyota race car got hit with a squirrel or ran over a squirrel or yeah. inhaled a squirrel. <laughs> that, that sounded bad. Um, such a cool race though, you know, and it's some of our correspondents were there. All the history, all the, just such a high level of competition, the element of danger that goes into it, the way the automakers get so, fired up about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every year I try to watch some of it, a little bit of Sebring, maybe a little bit of like the Rolex 24 at Daytona. Like I'm not the biggest like endurance car racing fan, but it's just, I really appreciate it, especially being in the business. And they're like little touchstones throughout the, throughout the year. So I don't know. I, I think Lamar is, is always a nice kind of sort of kick off to summer. It is fun to have on, you know, if you're just, doing stuff and then you just leave it on the TV and check in on it throughout the day. Yeah. Um, it was also pretty interesting how, uh, I, mean, I feel like it, it made a little more noise this year. Automakers were, were using Le Mans as a sort of, uh, a soapbox for, you know, upcoming products like Ford, um, you know, showed its, uh, Mustang that, it, you know, it's Le Mans Mustang that it's going to be, um, racing in the future and that was that was pretty cool mm -hmm. um and toyota took the, the chance to introduce uh kamui kobayashi as mm -hmm. uh its new uh nascar <laughs> driver yeah uh which i think is also pretty cool he uh he's a he's a great racer um you know Le, Le Mans winner um didn't do so well in f1 but uh, it'll be interesting to see how he does in NASCAR, but yeah, uh, Le Mans is a is a great I mean, a great world stage for you know any automaker to to sort of make some announcements, and it's also a really good test bed for for technology, especially you know uh, hybrid and electrification and stuff. So um, it's a, I've I've always wanted to go. I've 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 never been. Yeah, me too. To, to the race, um, I think that'd be fun. It'd be a it'd be a challenge too to cover and to um, just, you know, stay awake and alert through the whole thing. But, you know, going, you know, 
moving around from corner to corner and and just uh, you know s- staying up for the whole 24 hours would be quite the experience sounds good sounds good i i would like to go too i'd like to go where that would just be on the bucket list of things to do yeah. you know and it'd kind of wreck you i would imagine for like a week you'd come home and probably try not to do too much for a few days but uh it's awesome so yeah all right, so let's talk about what we've been driving. We've got some cool stuff. Going to leave things off with the final drive of the Chrysler 300C. It is, you know, it's a car I have a lot of thoughts about. I've been, it arrived, this is Wednesday. It arrived later Monday. It actually arrived early Monday. And I've, I like, in one day, I burned through like a third of a gallon, a third of a tank of gas. I've just been driving it. It's got that visceral sound, the rumble, even when you're just sitting there at idle. I usually back into my driveway and then gun the engine a few times. Uh, in case you're wondering what exactly this is, uh, maybe you missed the email, if you will. So this is the 300C. They haven't actually sold the 300C per se since 2020. <laughs> you could still get the 5.7 liter V8, which is a pretty big engine, like 363 horsepower. But that was more like available on the 300S. So it wasn't the C, you know, that iconic car that goes back to like, the 50s even, as far Mm -hmm. as being like the real, you know, 300 muscle car. So the C is back and it's got a big badge on the grill and on the seats to let you know that. And they didn't just say, hey, we're going to give you the letter. They dropped in the 6.4 liter Hemi V8, naturally aspirated, 485 horsepower. It's, It's a riot. You know, I think there were some rumors they might do Hellcat. I don't think you need to do it. You know, this is the 300. You know, it's a little bit like right. classier, a little bit maybe bougier. Like you don't need all that. It sounds right. It's a ton of power. It's basically a Chrysler Scat Pack. So that's the big engine and not much else aside from yeah. some design stuff, which it's to the, me is all you need. Yeah, it's it's the best setup, I think. <laughs> the Scat Pack is the way I would go. 100%. I, I, very few people I have actually, there's a couple, but in our like usually in the podcast, I would always do Scat Pack over Hellcat or you know, like any demon, if you will. To me, this is it. And it's a very fitting send off for, uh, you know, Chrysler icon. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be weird to see it go, but it's funny. Wally, my son was asking me um, over the weekend. He's like, what, cars does chrysler make because you can only think of the pacifica (laughs) yeah well yeah well there's the 300 he's like i don't even know what that is i'm like right right i mean kind of of forgot that it exists you know (laughs) yeah and that's kind of like that's kind of what i'm writing too is like you may have forgot about the 300 um because chrysler seems to have forgotten about the 300 quite frankly but yeah i remember seeing this at the at the detroit show and taking a look around it and Mm -hmm. you know it it looks fairly normal. Uh, yeah. know, there's, some, there's some badging and, and mm-hmm. you know, some embroidery inside. Uh, but when you open the hood, that's when you yep. <laughs> realize that this yeah. is something different. But yeah, it is, it is a really cool send off for, for the 300. 2000 for the US, 200 for Canada. I believe they're all spoken for. Um, you know, it's my guess is that they will bring back the 300. We don't know what it's going to be, but the Land Cruiser's back. We think the Bolt's coming back. It's actually somewhat rare for very successful names to totally disappear. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Chrysler has used the 300 name. They used it in the 50s and 60s. They've used it for years. Sometimes it takes a couple decades off. It's too good of a name not to use. So, I, I imagine it'll be back. And, you know, just driving it, it reminds me just how significant this car was for Chrysler. You know, it's that LX platform that, you know, they ended up using for the Charger, the Challenger, the Dodge Magnum deep yeah. cut. Um, <laughs> and I think it was really the first successful, like, thing that the Germans and the Americans came together and made after that Daimler Chrysler merger. Because you remember the first try was, one of the first tries was the Chrysler Crossfire, which didn't go yeah. great. You know, <laughs> not great, Bob. Um, so, although some people did like that SRT version of it. So, this was, not only did this go well, it was a home run. It won every Car of the Year award you could think of. It totally reset the industry. I remember how annoyed GM and Ford execs were. They're like, well, great, Chrysler has one car. And I remember reporters would be like, well, how many do you have in 2006? 
and the answer was not many, you know? Right. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a good send off. Let's put it that way. I'm having fun driving this thing. Um, yeah. So, uh, check out the site. It, the story probably won't be up by the time this publishes, but, uh, likely in July, I'll probably have a pretty good, good, um, you know, good write up. And I think I'm going to, I might try and go into like some of the older neighborhoods um, in the Metro Detroit area, try to get that kind of old feel yeah. flair. There's this like 1920s mansion that was listed in, I think, Palmer Woods uh, that I kind of just want to like, like you got to drive the car. You might as well drive it somewhere. Right. Try to go take some pictures over there, maybe. That'd be cool. So we'll see. We'll see where the week takes me. Maybe a car and coffee. All right, so you've been playing PlayStation on the clock, apparently, <laughs> uh, in the Sienna. How's that going? Um, well, let's see. I, I wanted to test out the rear seat entertainment because okay. I hadn't. Yeah. And rear seat entertainment systems, I don't know. Nowadays, you know, when tablets and, and you know, your phone can play movies, uh, doesn't seem all that practical. So mm-hmm. I, I tested it out. Um, and the... Rear seat entertainment in the Sienna, it's a single screen uh, that comes down from the ceiling in the middle. Um, and then there's an HDMI input. Um, there's an inverter, you know, so there's a there's a plug on the back of the center console. Um, so I, I took my PlayStation out there and plugged it all in and um, you know, opened up the screen and I couldn't get the PlayStation to power up. <laughs> there's a little button. Uh, to the left of the steering wheel on the dash that you have to press to turn on the AC uh, plugs in the back. There's one, there's one on the back of the center console and there's one in the cargo area. Um, and you have to press it every time you want to um, activate those plugs. Uh, it, it turns off every time you turn off the car. So once I remembered that that thing existed, I was able to uh, fired up and it fired up and, and worked just great. Um, no uh, power issues. There's plenty of, of power. I think there's like 1500 watts uh, available through um, through the inverter. And um, the the quality is okay, but it's 1080. Um, and uh, the thing is the the screen. Uh, when you fold it down, it blocks your view out the back through the rear view mirror. Now you can get a digital mirror, um, you know, the camera uh, mm-hmm. feed through the mirror, uh, but our tester doesn't have that. So you, you're driving around, you know, kind of blind as though you're full, full up of cargo uh, with that. Um, and then you know it comes with a couple of wireless headphones, so you can either play it through the speakers or through the headphones. And if you're doing it through the headphones, then whoever's driving can still listen to whatever they want. Um, but you know when when a package like this costs you know seventeen hundred dollars, uh, it just it doesn't make sense really to me anymore. Um, and especially like the one screen, uh, everyone wants their own screen. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I like the, having the screens on the back of the headrest, if you're going to have, you know, fixed screens at all, having them on the back of the headrest is, is a little better. Um, you know, if you're, if you want to watch anything from the second row, you're both passengers are going to be craning their necks, um, to, to look at it, but you know, everything did run seamlessly. I didn't have to troubleshoot anything to get the, except for that button to, (laughs) to get, the uh you know the display to work um and uh yeah it was it was just pretty pretty seamless pretty plug and play but um it just seems i don't know i would i wouldn't spend my money on on a on a rear seat entertainment system especially this one maybe yeah. some maybe some of the other ones that have you know uh you know apps built in like youtube and netflix and stuff like you you know, some of the other like Kia, Kia Carnival, I think has has some of those, and that seems like a better fit for today. But yeah, you know, but yeah, I I just went up north in it, and and Wally, you know, just had a tablet that he 
watched a movie on um, rather than watch anything on that that you have to plug things into. <laughs> yeah, we had the uh, BMW 760 with the fold down like theater screen, mm-hmm. which was insane. Oh, yeah, um, that's, that's it's it's a lot, man. Yeah, that's a that's a whole different ball game there. <laughs> For what it's worth, though, I tend to agree with you. You can get like. 80 60 to 80 percent of like your entertainment value with an ipad or something mm-hmm. like it almost seems like automakers don't need to invest as much in some of these like like the hardware and having to find hard points for them you know like i mean i think a lot of people are very happy just having phone time you know yeah, yeah. um so i don't know cool so you've been driving the uh the escape mm-hmm. that is I haven't driven an escape in quite some time. I remember like in the, so this is like the refresh and you yep. had the, uh, it's the ST line, right? Yep. That's kind of gnarly. How was it? It was good. Um, I like the, the looks of the refresh and then the ST line, I think really makes this look better. Um, you know, uh, body color cladding and, uh, it, you know, the, this one had the, uh, black wheels it had the red paint and the black wheels um it just looked a lot sportier than you know any other escape i've ever driven <laughs> so i mean the, the escape is is a pretty you know fun crossover you know compact crossover to drive uh, you know, compared to some of the other mainstream compact crossovers it's you know pretty tight handling it's it's um and then with the with the uh, EcoBoost 4, the two liter EcoBoost, um, plenty of power on tap. Um, so it was, it was nice to have some of the the looks to go along with it. Um, you know, bigger okay. spoiler in the back. Uh, and then, yeah, the updated uh, front fascia with the new headlights and new, new grill. And then the ST line had this nice black mesh on the grill. Um, so yeah, the looks of, of the ST line, a little better, uh, vibe with how the car actually drives. Um, the ST line elite, which this was, um, you know, there's three different ST line trims. Um, the ST line elite has a light bar that goes across, um, uh, just underneath the hood between the headlights and it looks really good at night. Um, and it kind of reminds me of, of the. F-150 Lightning, only you know, shrunken down. Um, and then it's got the, the new uh, front fascia. It looks a little more like the Ford Edge. Mm. So it's, it's sort of borrowing DNA from, from other Ford vehicles and tying it all together. And then inside, the refresh gets uh, this new 12.3-inch uh, infotainment display uh, running Sync 4. And it's quite the improvement. Man, that screen is really really crisp just one of the clearest screens I, i've seen um and pretty easy to use um but yeah it was it was nice to drive it was nice to reacquaint myself with with the escape the interior you know uh this st line elite had you know nice leather seats and um uh, some nice you know carbon, carbon fiber looking uh trim um sort of distracts you from the the you know black plastics that sort of are all over (laughs) the escape this this seems a little less of a desert of black Mm -hmm. black plastic um so yeah it, it was it was nice i i i still like the escape um it's it's a little on the pricey side but um Every time I get in one, I, I, I enjoy driving it. And um, yeah, I, I like it a little bit better now with the with the updated looks and um, the availability of this ST line appearance package. Yeah, I, I think the the update is is a good move for them. And I think adding that package makes a lot of sense, too, because I think there's a lot of people who uh, I'm always surprised how many people check that box for like crossovers. Like, yeah, I'll take the the sporty ish package, even if it's just an appearance, but yeah, good way to make a little more money. And I think the consumers like it too. Yeah. I, I, and on this one, it, it really just makes the car look uh, yeah. a little less drab. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, yeah, it gives a little bit of personality, which I think the escape needed. All right. So you drove a school bus yeah. this week. That's pretty wild. Tell me about that. Yeah. So it's this company called Lightning E-Motors and they, they basically have three products right now. They have a, a Ford Transit van that they electrify. They okay. have um, a GM, you know, class four chassis that they electrify. Uh, that they use for you know school buses, shuttle buses, things like that, and then they have a mobile um, DC charger. So it's it's a trailer with you know up to like four or five uh, charge points on it that you know for rescues or for if you need to set something up at a job site or something like that or a you know a, a temporary installation. Um, but yeah, I actually got to drive the the Transit and uh, the GM one, which was the in this case it was an electric school bus, um, one of the you know smaller school buses. And uh, yeah, it was. <laughs> I, I haven't driven a gas or diesel powered school bus before, but I was really uh, shocked at how easy it was to drive this one. Um, <laughs> they even set up some cones and <laughs> you could do a little slaloming. Um, in this parking lot on Belle Isle, it was, it was pretty neat. Um, nice. Yeah. So it, it, I think right now is a, is a tipping point for electric school buses. Uh, it's yeah. been sort of ignored for too long. Um, but it's, it's a way a lot of, you know, fleets could, could save money. Um, you know, in the long run, you're, you're paying probably close to double up front. Mm -hmm. um, when you buy an electric school bus as opposed to a diesel one, but, um, you know, your, your costs of operating are far, far, far less. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a big area of concern for a lot of, a lot of states and, mm -hmm. and municipalities is air quality and, and, uh, and climate. So, um, yeah, moving to electric buses is uh, sort of uh, an underserved niche in the market, and um, yeah, Lightning is is aiming to serve that uh, at least for you know the, some of the smaller uh, operations. Um, but you know, the, some of the the longtime makers like Bluebird and stuff are going electric now too. Uh, so I think I think we're going to start to see a lot more electric school buses, uh, but yeah, driving that was was really fun. Pretending I was a bus driver and you know, nice. You, you have that weird weird handle that you pull yeah. to, to open the door. <laughs> it's it's just it's always fun to get to drive something like that that you don't get to drive every day. And the fact that it was ele electric um, made it even more fun. It's you know, super quiet. They they have basically one level of regen baked into it customers can sort of specify what they want um and and you can get over the air updates and um another one thing this company does is is they have really good fleet management system and you know they take all the data from all the cars that they have out on the road and if you go to their website you can sort of plug in what your fleet would be doing your route your you know uptime downtime all that stuff uh temperature of where you're going to be and it will tell you which vehicles would work for you um and it's, it's kind of neat just that they using that um that information in real time you know, every time they get new it's constantly updating uh the algorithm but that's interesting. yeah that was neat <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because when you think of the use cases for a lot of school buses, mm -hmm. they go, they put a lot of miles on between, say, 7 a.m. and like 9 a.m. Most of them sit for a while. They go back somewhere. Many districts have like holding yards or places they like refuel. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to put diesel in them. You could just go to a big charging bank, you know, mm -hmm. and then, you know, then from like three to say five, they get used again, come back charge them up for another, you know, whatever. And, you know, you, away you go. It's in some ways, it's a very, very ideal use case. 
Yeah, and they've got vehicle to grid technology. So when they're yeah. just sitting there, you know, they could sell money. I mean, sell energy back to the grid, yeah. and you know, it takes your cost of operations even lower. And yeah, yeah so they've got they've got uh, in San Diego at the airport. I think San Diego. They're they're yeah. running um, these Lightning e motors uh, shuttle buses um, from one of the parking lots. And then DHL is a customer for their transit, uh, and you know they've got m modular batteries, you know, scalable batteries, um, and so uh, their DHL's California fleet has you know three of these forty kilowatt hour packs in their in their trucks, but in New York they only have one in there, you know, which is about you know I think sixty miles of range because you know New York is built very vertically so they're not yeah. driving very far um which i thought was kind of an interesting thing yeah, yeah i i think it'll be interesting to see like i different you know automotive executives who i've kind of interviewed over the years have often said like you know cars are important but doing like buses you know heavy duty machinery those things are big they drive a lot and they put out a lot of pollutants if mm -hmm. we could kind of do that you're like you know you're you're taking a big swing at things, you know, and arguably it's more important to make like a school bus electric than it is to make somebody, you know, turn in a Chevy Cruze that's getting 30 miles to the gallon, you know? Yeah. It, it's taking a big swing at a problem and, you know, could be interesting. Yeah, and there's some interesting use cases like mining where, the, oh, where, yeah. where, you know, if you, you know, fill something up with, with a load at the top of the hill, and drive it down the hill, it actually uh, gets more in regen going down the hill than it needs to go, go back up empty. <laughs> yeah. So it's like almost, uh, it's free energy, it almost seems like. so. Free energy. I think that's what we're all going for, right? Yeah. Ideally. <laughs> all right. So uh, that's the drive section. Um, and that's all the time we have. Uh, it's been a good show. I think we've run through a lot of different things. Um, please send us your Spend My Monies. That's podcast at autoblog.com. If you enjoy the show, we'd love to get five stars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get the show. Please tell a friend about it. You know, we try to get the word out. Hope a lot of enthusiasts uh, enjoy the Autoblog podcast. So that's it for this week. Be safe out there, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>